Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening for our program, The European Homefront During World War II, a conversation with authors L. Annette Binder and Sandil Morse, where each author explores the lives of people on the European continent during the Second World War, but from very different perspectives. Elinette Bender is the author of The Vanishing Sky, a work of fiction inspired by her own family history that explores the lives and situation of a rural family in Germany in 1945 as the war is winding down. The novel has received much attention, including being a 2020 New York Times summer reading book selection and a New York Post best books of the week selection, as well as recently having been featured in the Colorado Springs Gazette. Kirkus says of her book, a masterful story of war, horror, and love. Sandel Morris is the author of The Spiral Shell, about a French village that reveals its secrets of a Jewish resistance in World War II. This memoir chronicles the stories of people who lived the history of the resistance efforts in this small village in Vichy, France, against its German occupiers. Of her book, the author Alice McDermott says, she illuminates with wisdom and grace Ellie Weisel's timeless injunction that for the dead and the living, we must bear witness. After this presentation, the authors will be taking questions. So you may either place any questions you may have in the chat box or also on your Zoom controls, you can raise your hand and ask them in person. And either way, we will get to as many as time allows. Both authors will also be graciously giving away a copy of their book. So we will be randomly selecting two names from those that submit questions or have registered for our program. And we will email the winners in the next few days. So again, thank you for being with us this evening. And welcome to El Annette Bender and Sandel Morse. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. It's such a pleasure uh, to be here this evening. Um, I grew up in Colorado Springs, went to Mitchell High School, uh, spent many hours, as I was telling Brian earlier, studying at the downtown branch of the library. So it's really um, special to be here uh, reading. Uh, with all of you, along with Sandel, who will be reading from her beautiful memoir um, tonight. Um, as Brian mentioned, uh, my novel, The Vanishing Sky, is set in Germany during the last six months of World War II, and it tells the story of a mother named Etta Huba, who's trying mightily to hold her family together, uh, just as the Allies are starting to break through Germany's Western fortifications. Um, Edda's older son, Max, has come home from the Eastern Front, suffering from a mental breakdown. And as his condition worsens, Edda knows she's going to have to hide him because she knows the authorities will take him from her if they find out how sick he really is. And at the same time, her younger son, Georg, who's only 15, has run away from his post in the Hitler Youth and is trying to make his way back home to her. Uh, the novel was inspired, as Brian said, by events in my own family history, and before I read or talk about the book, I thought I would share with everyone um, some photographs that reveal a little bit about the inspiration for the book. Um, let's see, fingers crossed. All right. Hopefully everyone can see this. Um, the book is set in um, the town of Machtheidenfeld am Main, where my family is from. It's in uh, the southern region of Germany in Lower Franconia or Unterfranken. And 
my father was actually from a very small town right next to Mark Heidenfeld called Simon. And my mother was from the town right across the river from Zimmern called Rodenfels. And all of these towns, Markt Heidenfeld and the two smaller ones, are just a few kilometers, maybe 40 kilometers away from a very beautiful old historic city in, in Germany called Würzburg, um, which predates the Roman era. It's a very old city. It's known for its beautiful half-timbered houses and for a very old, well-regarded university. And it's also on the Main River. And Würzburg, like many of the German cities, uh, was firebombed by the Allies, uh, in this case by the Royal Air Force, and was largely destroyed uh, in mid-March 1945 uh, about four to five thousand people lost their lives. Many thousands more were uh, made homeless and the inner city was completely uh, destroyed by a firestorm. Um, and my mother's, one of her earliest memories is actually of her father coming home from the city of Wurzburg, having survived an earlier firebombing um, attack on the train station. And she remembers even now his uh, bloody winter, uh, his bloodied winter coat and how banged up he was as he came home. Um, another thing that I found out about the beautiful city of Wurzburg as I was writing is that the university psychiatric clinic there uh, was an instrumental part in the German program of murdering people with mental illness and um, other neurological impairments. And this well-regarded university had this terrible evil secret uh, at its center in that it was murdering these people and then giving their bodies to the medical school for dissection and people just seemed to go on um, with business as usual even as these younger otherwise healthy corpses were coming in to the medical school. Now the book really started in earnest. I was only maybe 20 pages in when I came across a photo album of my father. Uh, both of my parents were German and my father had never spoken to me about his childhood. So I was very excited when I came across this photo album. And um, here he is at the age of seven in, on the school steps uh, in the town of Zimmern. And I went through and I thought what a cute kiddo he was. And I, I just was amazed to see my father as this young boy. Uh, it's always strange to see your parents as children, I suppose, uh, to think of them that way. And then the last photograph that I came across was him in his Hitler Youth uniform. And though I shouldn't have been shocked at the photograph, because I know he was born in 1930, uh, so service was compulsory for most boys at that point, uh, it was still shocking to see him in his uniform and to see the expression on his face. Uh, the expression in his eyes more than anything lingered with me. And then there was a big gap in the album and the next photograph I had was of my father as a 20 year old uh, in Canada. Uh, so there was this big mystery about his childhood and what, what he'd done in the Hitler Youth, what his life was like. And so what I did was I went to my mother and my mother who'd also been very quiet about their lives in Germany started telling me what she knew and what my father had told her. And so what I found out was that my father struggled mightily with the expectations of his father. Uh, his father was a school teacher and the mayor of a, a small town and had very high expectations for both his sons. And my father, unlike his older brother who was serving on the Eastern Front, uh, much like the mucks in the book, uh, my father rebelled against these expectations and family lore has it that he ran away from his post in the Hitler Youth. Uh, I don't know whether it was true because there's no way for me to confirm it at this point, um, but that's what I found out. And then one of the only other things that I was really able to find was very chilling to me. And this was the ancestry notebook that my father, like other Germans of the era, was required to complete. And it has tabs for your parents your grandparents, your great grandparents, it goes back, back, back up the family tree. And so my father was able to complete it going all the way back to 1819. And if you look closely at it, um, 
It requires documentation either from a town or from a priest showing that you have no Jewish ancestry. Uh, and this was absolutely terrifying and chilling uh, to me uh, to see this evil regime's uh, demands sort of on paper right in front of me uh, with my own family's information in it. And that fear that I felt looking at this and that I imagined people must have felt as they filled these forms and notebooks out really stayed with me as I wrote the story um, and found its way in in different ways. And then the other thing that I thought was very interesting that I found was my father's school notebook from when he would have been nine here, when he was nine. And he's learning how to write the letter G in the old German script, which looks very <laughs> strange to my eye. Um, but what was amazing to me about it was that to learn the letter G, one of the words that they had to write again and again was Göring, Göring, Göring. And another one was Goebbels, Goebbels, Goebbels. And how the indoctrination and how the, the regime sort of absolutely infiltrated every aspect of life all the way down to some nine-year-old's cursive notebook. And again, that's something that stayed with me as I wrote the book. But what really lingered more than anything was this photograph of my father, which I kept on my desk um, as I wrote and the expression in his eyes. Um, so that I think gives you a sense of what I found out. And it's a mystery, really, my family at its core, because my father, who passed away when I was 16, never shared anything with me, and I was never sharp enough when he was around to ask him. And so when I don't have the facts anymore to write nonfiction, what I did was I just imagined, I imagined the Huber family, which is in some ways like the Binder family, but in other ways completely different. And so it gave me freedom to imagine some of the stories that my father might have told me had I thought to ask and had he been willing to share. Um, so the first little bit that I'm going to read is just a very short piece um, from one of the chapters about Georg, the younger Huber son, who is at a Hitler youth camp and is now working on fortifying the um, German trenches to keep the Allies out from the West. And what has happened here is that three of the boys have escaped and have been caught. And um, Georg himself has been pondering uh, escaping. And so he watches with uh, great concern what happens to these three boys. Schneider came running to the trench with the news. His boots were both untied and it took him a while to catch his breath. They got them is what he said. He coughed and fanned his face. They brought them back already. Georg kept stacking the buckets. He didn't want to stop. He didn't want to listen, but he could hear Schneider and everything he said. They'd gone only eight kilometers before the border police found them. Eight kilometers in three days because they went in circles once they were in the forest. He'd heard it from Groff, who overheard the nurses talking by the infirmary, and so it had to be true. They walked around the same trees and couldn't find their way. And on the third day, they lay down beside a beech tree and went to sleep. That's how the police found them, sleeping by a stream. He saw them the next morning when he marched to the hole. They were strung from two of the linden trees in front of the church. They swung like lanterns and the littlest one had reached around the rope and his fingers froze like that. They clenched tight by his throat. All day, Georg thought of them and how they swung. He stopped by again that afternoon. He stayed late at the trench so he could walk back alone and visit them. Idiots the way they did it. They should have planned it better. They should have brought maps with them and a compass and warm clothes because the weather was turning already and soon the snow would start. And what would they do then? What would they do in their shorts and their thin socks? They could have asked him. He would have gone he and Müller both, and the five of them would be far from the trench and the mattresses and the linden trees. They might even be home already. He tried to feel sorrow for them, but only anger came. He wanted to bring them back so he could shout at them and tell them all the things they'd done wrong. He wanted to shake them by the shoulders. He stood below the branches instead and looked at their muddy shoes. 
The next morning, someone had led her to sign by the base of each tree where they hung. Look at me, the sign said. Look how far I ran. They hung for four days, and then they were gone, and the signs were gone too, but he could still see the marks the strap had left on the branches. Um, because I did not know much about my father's experience in the Hitler Youth, I had to do a lot of research, uh, first-person accounts of life in the Hitler Youth, and one book that was particularly um, fascinating and helpful and honest is a book by Alphonse Heck. Um, it's called The Child of Hitler, uh, where he really describes his indoctrination as a young boy uh, during the Reich and how passionately he believed in the cause and how it took him years and years afterwards to come to terms with the effects of his indoctrination and the things that he believed as a result of it. And so this, this book in, in many ways was uh, a surrogate for the stories that my father might have told me about what it was like to be indoctrinated like that. Um, and in many cases, um, researching the Hitler Youth accounts, researching accounts of people who survived the um, Allied bombing of the German uh, civilian centers was what helped me pull together the stories that I needed to imagine uh, the Huber family's experience uh, at the end of the war like this. Um, another short section that I'd really love to read uh, is about the mother, Etta Huber, who is an older woman at this point by German standards of the age. She's in her 50s, not old by our standards for sure. Um, and she has just visited one of her dear friends named Ilse, who's an old childhood friend of hers. And um, Ilse is about to show her something, about to reveal something to Etta uh, in her cellar. And I think that's all you need to know. Uh, Ilse took Etta to the cellar when it was time to go. She took her down the stairs, past the straw beds where she kept her apples and her plums, and lifted her oil lamp high. Etta blinked and her eyes adjusted, and she stepped back at what she saw. There were silver candle holders and serving platters and fine inlaid tables. Clocks ticked in the silence of that room. Porcelain mantel clocks and larger wall clocks propped up one against the other. A grandfather clock stood improbably in the corner, and she wondered who had brought it around the house and down those narrow stairs. There were tea sets and goblets and dressing combs, cigarette cases and leather-bound books. Porcelain dolls with fine painted faces sat in a row, their blue eyes open and unblinking. Things were stacked neatly against all three walls, wonderful, lustrous things that were the pride of their owners, that belonged on dressers and piano tops and dining room hutches, and not in a cellar that was dark and smelled of earth and hay. By God, Edda said, it's a museum you've got here. They're not mine. Ilse drew her hand across a blue silk dress. I'm watching them. It had started with old Frau Singer, Ilse told her who had come for a visit five years before and sat in her kitchen. Ilse looked around the room. Her voice was low when she spoke. She looked at the clock and not at Etta, and her voice shook a little from the liquor. The old lady had been nervous and held her purse against her lap. They drank coffee together and talked of little things, and when the coffee pot was empty, Frau Singer waited a good while longer before asking. Frau Weinstein came next, and then the young Frau Stern, who had the grandest house of all, high on the hill where the tower stood. They came to her and asked for the same favor, and each time Ilse agreed, because it didn't seem right to say yes to one and no to another. She waved away their offers to pay. Keep your money and your gold, she told them. I'm an old woman and have no need for them. Her cellar became a warehouse of beautiful and cherished things. She came down and dusted the piles every week, and she wound the clocks and polished the silver because it tarnished fast in the damp air. When they come back, they'll thank me, Ilse nodded as she spoke. They'll thank me for taking good care of their things. And even as she said it, they both knew it wasn't true. Maybe it was the liquor, or maybe the coming rain, 
The roads looked narrower than usual when Etta walked home. The wind bit through her scarf. She thought of those dolls and their patent shoes and all that fine silver and the clocks ticking in the cellar and Ilse keeping watch, just Ilse and her whiskey jars. How hard to be in that house alone with all those things. The air must be thick with ghosts. How little she knew about Ilse. More than 40 years together in church every week, they drank their coffee and birthed their babies and knelt together at their family graves and they were mysteries one to the other. Etta stopped once by the bridge and wound her scarf across her mouth. People were inside already. They were drawing their curtains and snuffing out their lights. They huddled close to their wood-burning stoves, which sent up smoke into the sky, gray on gray. People were born in Heidenfeld and buried there, and their children too, and their children's children. They lived in the same houses, one generation after the next, and went to the same schoolhouse, and worshipped at the same churches. The buildings outlasted them all. And still people went away. They went away sometimes, carrying only a satchel or a trunk. She'd seen it herself, the Weinsteins and the Singers and the Stans who left behind their things. The two sisters who were prone to twitches and to fits, twins who dressed alike and worked side by side by Frau Ebing, the seamstress, and they climbed aboard the train one morning and never came back. Young Hillen with his baby face was gone and the gypsies went somewhere too. They were gone from one day to the next and there were no more bonfires by the riverbank then and no more dancing. How easy it was to forget them. Things changed and the mind adjusted and it was an act of will to remember anything at all. Um, and that, that was absolutely beautiful, and you have ended with one of my absolutely favorite phrases in the whole book, which is, it was an act of will to remember anything at all. And when anyone is in that sort of a situation, which is so strange and painful and stressful, and you really, you know, and you don't know. I'm in a mini situation like that right now. Someone said to me, I'm in the middle of a move. This is my last night in my old house. And someone said to me, are you going to celebrate? What are you going to do? And I, I said, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to think of this as just any other night. So I am willfully putting any of that stuff that I need to do out of my head. Um, and I think that you and I um, both touch on very similar themes from very different points of view. Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of in a way exploring one of the questions you ask is, where did they go? And so my book is pretty much from a, a Jewish point of view. And I am, I am Jewish, and I came into writing this book. Um, in, it all began in 2011 when I was awarded a residency at the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. And I learned that the town um, in which this little residency um, was, was Ovilar, and it was on the pilgrimage route, um, which uh, ends up at the Shrine of St. James in Santiago de Compostela. So I began researching the village. I began researching um, and exploring my own mind. And I was thinking about a crusader's route. And then I was thinking about Jews. And then I began to think about Jews and the Second World War. And I went to see a very dear friend who was a rabbi who put me in touch with a woman um, who is French, lives in Paris, and spoke beautiful, still speaks beautiful English, and is a Jewish historian. And we became very, very good friends, and she actually became my translator. I uh, contacted another friend who's a poet who had been to the village and done some work with um, writing poetry about a couple of Jewish resistance workers in the village. And she gave me a name to investigate, and that name was Jean Hirsch. And he was a nine-year-old resistance courier during the war. And Hirsch is my maiden name. And so I felt immediately 
connected to him. He, his family was also from the Alsace-Lorraine, as my father's family was as well. And so I began almost, the title of the book is The Spiral Shell, A French Village Reveals Its Secrets of Jewish Resistance in Vichy, France, or in, in France uh, during World War II. Um, and I almost feel as if I spiraled down into this material. And I am going to briefly show you some slides. And the first um, slide I'm going to show you will be a map of France. And I will point out the village, but tonight for some strange reason, I noticed this afternoon, I'm really not talking too much about the village, which I adore, became my second home and I returned to year after year for eight or nine years. Um, but I'm going to talk about some folks that I met while I was in Paris. So I'm going to share my screen right now and um, start with a map of France. And I want to show you that Paris is north up here. And the um, next slide I'm going to show you will be in a village called Bouillus or Dordogne, which is down here. And the um, village of Ovilar lies somewhere in here, unnamed. It's very tiny, um, maybe about a thousand residents. It lies uh, between Bordeaux and Toulouse. So when I met Valerie, she introduced me to a woman named Germaine Polyakov. And Germaine was 92 when I met her. And during the war, she had been a caretaker in a secret house in that little village I showed you, Bouillus or Dordon. Well, I took a road trip and had a wonderful time and went to speak with a local historian. And I came to see this house. And this house housed Jewish refugee girls. Um, the house was run by the Jewish scouts. And before the war, the scouts were just a normal scouting organization. But during the war, they turned their considerable organizational skills to rescuing Jewish children. And this, was a, this house was for girls. And what you, it's located in a tiny little square right in the village. And what you can't see is over on this side of the slide, out of view is the large Abbey of St. Peter. And over um, about here, out of your view, maybe down here, there's a statue of the Virgin and Child. And directly across from these uh, large doors, there's a restaurant and it's still a restaurant today. And during the uh, war, that restaurant was owned and operated by the Lopez family, a Catholic family that were very, very active in the resistance. And they actually knowingly rented this house to the Jewish scouts and they knew it was full of Jewish children. In fact, uh, their daughter, Adrian, cared for Jewish, uh, the youngest of the Jewish children in uh, rooms above the restaurant. So I have always imagined the villagers walking to the abbey and I've imagined the priest standing outside his massive wooden door and welcoming his parishioners to mass and every one of them passing by and knowing that this house was full of Jewish children. I am gonna just tell you one tiny little story of probably one of the reasons they were able to survive here. And it was because of the villagers. Um, there was one gendarme who was posted in this village during the war. And before orders came for a roundup of, uh, of Jews, he would go to this house and he would knock on the door and he would tell Madame Gordon, the director, he would say, you must leave now, the Germans are coming. And so when I visited and interviewed Germaine as a young, uh, when she was here, she showed me some photos. And this is Germaine during the war. And this is her friend, Sultan. And they are in a room that they share inside uh, that house. And what really struck me was this radio. Because if you look, this is an antenna going out the wall and outside. And this was illegal. And Germaine told me, that they would listen to the BBC on that radio and Madame Gordon would just whisper at them, girls, turn it down, turn it down. Um, 
And my next slide is of Germain, uh, the last time we were together, and that was a year ago this month. She was 100. She would turn 101 on December 15th and she passed away in February at the age of 101. And um, I feel her loss terribly, and I believe that I will feel it for the rest of my life. I'm going to read a little bit from my first interview with Germaine. I think I'll, I think I'll leave her up on there. You can look at her. You don't need to look at me at the moment. Um, I asked about a single day Germaine remembered vividly. Germaine folded her hands loosely in her lap and spoke of a day in 1944 when German soldiers were marching through Beaulieu sur dordogne and heading to Normandy. They were nervous, edgy, and shooting wildly. I was. Germaine rounded her hands and drew a dome in front of her belly, expecting my third child carrying my baby in one arm, dragging Daniel by his hand and running across a field to woods. I heard a shot. I knew what it was. I wasn't frightened. I felt calm. I don't know why. Naturally, she was frightened, but fear propelled her and gave her strength. A pregnant woman carrying her baby, dragging her toddler, her heart pounding, her belly cramping, adrenaline, pumping her legs. I looked into my cup of golden tea. How did she find her way through all that then integrate into the person she had become? I'm going to skip a bit because I don't want to get too long, but I there is a ending up to this chapter that I would really love to share with you. Um, and this is just before I'm leaving uh, Germaine's flat. At the door, Germaine said, people tell me I was courageous to do what I did. I did not know. Perhaps courage is acting not out of bravery, but out of the essence of who you are. Germaine offered her cheek and we kissed kissed. She was tired, she must nap. We talked a long time. You are going back to the States, she said. Yes, I said. I'd been away a month. I had decided with fairness to my husband, a month was the limit for my absences. For years, he provided the financial and emotional support for me to become more than I ever thought I could be. And I was grateful. Jermaine and I exchanged email addresses. She took my hand and held on. You must tell me when you will return. Not if I would return, when. I thought about journalists coming to interview Leon, but never Germaine as she sat in one of the apricot velvet chairs, looking on, her own story rumbling in her belly. Yes, I would return to listen to Germaine and to continue my research for answers to questions I hardly knew. The best way to find what I was looking for was let it reveal itself. So Leon, Leon is, um, was Germaine's second husband, not the father of all those children. And um, one day while we were talking, she asked me if I would like to meet a child that she had cared for in that house. And I thought, my gosh, is that really possible? Well, she introduced me to Yvonne. Yvonne. And Yvonne, um, this is Yvonne before the war, in the garden of her house. Uh, they she lived in a flat with a the, the garden, I think, out back uh, or a patio. And um, she was, I don't know, she might have been eight or nine. I don't know how close to 1938 this was taken. Uh, but she lived in a town called Ludwigshafen. And her family, both sides, had lived in this town for 10 generations. And they, uh, they traded in a carriage horses for, for generations. And I have a special kind of feeling for this um, because it reminds me of the garden and the expulsion from the garden was coming very, very quickly. Um, 
Now, this was Yvonne um, when I visited her, her one time. She was 10 years younger than Germaine. So she would have been in her early to mid 80s um, in this photograph. And um, when I interviewed her, I asked her about Kristallnacht. And um, to my surprise, she had uh, memories of Kristallnacht. And um, I'm going to read you just a little bit about um, that night. Um, Yvonne, oh, it looks like the pendant that I'm going to talk about is right there hanging from her neck. Um, so I think I maybe will end screen sharing and go back since I just read a little bit and then we'll uh, be together. There, okay. So I'll read a bit. Yvonne fingered a honey brown gemstone at her neck and spoke to me of Kristallnacht and the burning synagogue, her father rushing out of their flat and racing to rescue Talit, prayer shawls, and Siddur, prayer books. I'd never been this close to someone who'd experienced that night, the acrid smell of burning buildings, the sounds of storefront windows shattering, the shouts of gangs in the streets, beating Jews, the cries of terror. Still, her father had run out into the tumult, tumult to rescue Torres and Talit. Ivan said, my father returned. He carried Talit. Police came and took him away. Thugs came. They tore pictures from the walls and threw them into the street. She spoke in short, simple sentences reducing memory to simple facts, devoid of emotion, perhaps because the child who had once lived inside of her was beyond her recognition or held so tightly that she remained hidden. I wasn't sure which came first, the thugs or the arrest. Had Yvonne, her sister Marion, and Elsa, their mother, stayed in the flat and watched? Or had they sought refuge with a neighbor? How long did the rioting last? How long did the thugs stay in the flat? Yvonne shook her head. She did not know. She laced her fingers on the table, unlaced, then laced again. They took all of the Jewish men that night. Later, I heard them singing. Did you see the little Cohen with big ears like a donkey's? Cohen, Jew. She remembered the lyrics of a song that stigmatized, punished, and shamed. She did not remember the details of the horror. She stared at a small screened television, rabbit ears perched on top. The day after, I saw the shops, the broken windows, the burned synagogue. Here, in this flat, my belly hollowed out. I could not fathom seeing police take my father away or thugs filling my living room. What has this done to this child? Yvonne remembered a dream. I had a doll. You could turn the arms and legs. I took the doll and I threw it away in the cement yard. The doll broke, then came on fire. I was very angry. I saw the doll landing, body, head, arms, and legs smashing, then rising in flames. All through the war, Yvonne dreamed that dream. Now, leaning an elbow on the table, Yvonne said, I wonder what that doll symbolized. Life, as she and her family had known it for generations, began its end in 1933 when Hitler came to power. On Kristallnacht, it was finished. Thank you. Mm. That is so powerful, Sandel, and what it reveals about the experiences of just young, young children and how they carried it with them for the rest of their lives and how it sort of found its way down through the generations is just, you know, the trauma sort of continues and finds its way out years later. It does, and it's um, it's true of of the people in, in Germany, in your book as well, although the circumstances are very different, um, there is no one who is not affected by war 
and particularly no one who is not affected by total totalitarian regimes. Mm -hmm. That's why I think these two books um, are pretty um, timely at the moment. Well, I think, you know, the, the fear, the sort of they, as we sort of like to think of it, is, you know, that are always watching, that you cannot trust, uh, you can't even trust people within your own family necessarily because they may be the ones to uh, go to the authorities and reveal uh, your resistance or your dissent. It's, it's all encompassing and it absolutely infiltrates every aspect of life. And so I think that's true in Germany, that's true in France, where some people were resisting and other people were, were not. You know, other people were actually um, collaborating. Uh, I think it's hard to capture that uh, on a sort of global scale. I think that the best way, at least for me, in writing fiction to try and capture that was to do it on a very small family scale and show how that regime affected different people within the family differently. And I think you, in, in many ways, do exactly the same thing with real accounts of people's experiences during the war and how each of them was affected in very different ways by the by the trauma. Yeah, I think also um, there's a, what I also wanted to capture, I think, was a dailiness to life and how no matter what the circumstances are, one goes on. And these are particularly, although two men were my wonderful, inter, uh, gave me absolutely amazing information and interviews, um, and they were folks who lived in that little village, I think it's pretty much a, a women's story and about how women um, get through. And what I noticed with both Germaine and Yvonne, they have, and they have today, well, Germaine no longer, an incredible strength and incredible will. And I think anyone who got through that war uh, needed that. And I think Germaine particularly um, was, she was a young woman, she was very aware, and she concentrated on the dailiness of life. She concentrated on caring for those children, just as um, Etta concentrated on her family mm -hmm. and caring for her children. And this is, and she showed an incredible strength in doing that. That's right. I mean, I think the resilience of mothers in times of war was very much on my mind as I wrote. And also the daily rituals, the food, you know, I mean, in, in this case, it was the absence of food and the memory of those shared meals and trying to make your best with what you had, you know, on hand. But the idea of sitting around the table and just cherishing those everyday moments that are so easy to take for granted in times of ease and prosperity, but in times of adversity, when you're besieged, those moments have a golden glow about them. And um, you, you remember all the things that you've lost um, and you keep trying to go on one foot in front of the other. And, you know, the sort of domesticity of it, I think is a big, a big part of it. Uh, you know, I wasn't thinking of any of these things, of course, as I wrote, it was just the characters that were, you know, sort of guiding me through. But then afterwards, you can start to see the pattern. I don't know if that's true of you, too, that you sort of see the pattern of what you wrote about after you're done writing, and then you look at it critically and understand it a little bit better. Well, you know, I started out writing essays, so I had no idea what I was doing. As I, <laughs> so, as I said, um, the at, at another chat we had, I, um, I really think that if I had set out to do this, I would have been totally afraid of the whole project. I would have said, me? I can't do that. So it was very good for me to do it in little pieces and to sort of fall down into it and follow yeah. my trail. It, it, it is overwhelming. I mean, if someone had said, you're going to write a novel, I would have said, no, that's sort of impossible because those things are thick. <laughs> so, but someone once described it as, you know, you're driving a very long distance and your, your front lights only reveal a little bit ahead at a time. And that's the way to do it. Don't think about the end destination. Just think about what's revealed by your headlamps and just go that distance. And right. that, that really was what it was like because 
if I had really thought about the whole thing, this thing has to be 300 pages long and all these things have to happen, it would have been overwhelming for sure. Mm -hmm. Do you think we should have some questions? Sure, I'd love it. Absolutely. Uh, Ellen at Bender and Sandel Morse, thank you. Uh, some powerful content there and of course, Hopefully all of our attendees, if they have not yet done so, please pick up a copy of the book and read it. Um, we have one question, we have, uh, looks like a couple of questions in the chat. And of course, if anybody out there would like to ask another question, please put it in the chat or uh, raise your hand and Shannon will uh, bring you through and you can ask live. One of our first questions was for Annette, and it says, thank you, Annette, for sharing those pictures, especially the one of your father at age 14. May I ask what types of thoughts did you imagine in his eyes? Although I know what I see, I find it fascinating what you were able to see considering he was known to you as your father? Oh, that's a really interesting question. I'm gonna go back. <laughs> I'm gonna see if I can manage to do this twice. All right, yeah, here we go. Um, all right, so there's the photograph. Um, you know, my father was a very serious man, uh, the way I knew him uh, growing up, a very quiet man. Um, peaceful. Uh, we had a word, uh, Gemütlichkeit, which is the German word for sort of a, a peaceful tranquility. Uh, that sort of our house was very gemütlich. It was very calm, very quiet. We could all sit for hours around the kitchen table reading or doing, you know, drawing or doing whatever it is we were doing without really saying a word. Um, and so I think of my father as a very quiet man, um, but also uh, probably a little bit sad. Uh, his eyes always struck me as, as sad, sort of soulful. And so when I compared what my father looked like at seven, sort of mischievous, you know, the war hadn't started yet at that point, and his life was probably very different at seven from the way it was here when he was 13 or 14. Um, I guess what I see in his eyes is a solemnity and a sadness. And it's a sadness that I recognize um, from his adulthood. Um, and it's a sadness, I think, that may have been a result, at least in part, of his childhood and what was expected of him and how his childhood was in all likelihood over at this point um, because of his own family's expectations for him. Um, and, you know, maybe it was just also maybe he was a solemn person. Uh, I can understand that. I tend to be a little bit serious myself, you know, so, but I do, I see the sadness in his eyes and it's that sadness that lingered with me and that carried over into the character of Georg Huber, who runs uh, away from his post uh, in all likelihood for very different reasons, but he also carries that feeling of not fitting in and of struggling with what's required of him and of all the other boys and men uh, under the regime. So, yeah, but I knew right away it was my dad. I didn't have to flip the photograph to see what it was written on the back uh, because, you know, it, it, the eyes absolutely revealed that that was my father. Yeah, but thank you for asking that. Yeah. And the uh, participant who asked the question furthermore commented that both Sandel and Elinet exemplify the quote about courage. It's not so much connecting to bravery as it is meeting your true self. Both of you are courageous. Thank you so much. And thank you for your heartfelt response. No, thank you. Thank you, that's lovely, thank you. Another question here for you. Both books, The Spiral Shell and The Vanishing Sky, when you get to know the content, have very engaging titles. Would you be able to give some insight into how you selected them and some insight as to their meaning? 
Hmm. Do you want to go first, Sandel? Sure. I'll do. I'll go first. Um, I'm terrible at titles, and <laughs> for a long time I was calling this um, this file book um, because I really couldn't think of a title. Um, but there is one place toward the end of the book where I am touring um, a section of the Marais. The Marais is the Jewish section that I had never been to before. And on this tour, this tour guide uh, was pointing out something I couldn't quite see in one of the limestone blocks of a building. And most of the buildings in Paris are made of limestone because um, it, it's still mined from under under the city because the city was once an inland sea. And what he was showing me was a tiny indentation. And I was so fascinated that I hung back and I looked at it and then I finally figured it out and I traced it with my finger. It was the imprint of a very tiny spiral shell and it was the imprint, it was of a fossil. And so I caught up with my group and um, then at another spot on that same tour, we were in a, um, a garden and the tour guide was looking down into the path, which looked to me like tiny little stones, but they were shells. And he plucked something up and he went to hand it to me and I, I, I opened my palm and he dropped this tiny, tiny spiral shell into my palm and I don't know if you're going to be able to see it, but it is a tiny, 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 <laughs> tiny spiral shell. And um, it became symbolic to me um, and for me because um, my own thoughts, and this is also a personal memoir in which I uh, really kind of rediscover my own Jewish identity. It's more about identity than it is about faith or religion. And um, my own thoughts spiraled up. I spiraled down into the stories. And so the spiral shell just sort of seemed to be a perfect mm -hmm. metaphor. And then um, in order to tell a bit about what the book was about, because of the spiral shell, you might just think it's about the ocean or something. Mm -hmm. And so the subtitle, um, A French Village Reveals Its Secrets of Jewish Resistance in World War II. Mm, that's so interesting. Um, yeah, The Vanishing Sky was not the first title of my <laughs> novel either. Um, for a long time, the title was Mutti, which means uh, mom <laughs> in German. And then the publisher decided that's not going to work. And I totally understand why, because people are likely to mispronounce it muddy. Or even if you understand German and like the title, it's still a little odd to name a book Mom possibly for German speakers as well. So um, we went back to a key scene in the book um, that I did not read from today. That's a flashback of Etta, the mother, who's thinking back to her childhood and something terrible that she was party to um, in, her, uh, in her childhood that she and other children did, a sort of wrong beyond measure. And in that scene, the vanishing sky is something that comes up and because the sky is vanishing at various other points in the book because of the bombing or for whatever other reason, and because of its sort of symbolic value as well for sort of the loss of you know, sort of moral compass, how easy it is to get disoriented um, under this regime, it seemed to work, uh, it seemed to work well. Uh, so Muti went away and the vanishing sky came in instead. Excellent. Thank you very much. And we have another uh, comment from a participant today. Thank you very much. Thanks to you both for creating such human portraits of people struggling through the war. We often forget that while governments go to war, their citizens do not always have a choice in the matter. Let's not lose sight of humanity, the humanity that is present on both sides. May I just thank um, a person named Mary Galbraith, but who I know as Zizzy, for mm -hmm. that lovely, lovely comment. Um, we have known each other since we were both freshmen and roommates in college. 
Oh, <laughs> that's sweet. That's lovely. That's so lovely. Thank you for coming. You know, that's one of the lovely things of virtual events is that it allows you to reconnect with people or it's just really lovely. I, I've had that experience too. My high school Latin teacher, um, you know, um, Mrs. Ettenhofer, and just, just it, it's been a really uh, lovely experience to see people whom I haven't seen for a very long time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, going Absolutely. back to... Going back to what your friend Mary said, I think it's one thing that's a blessing about writing small stories, focusing on families or individuals like that, is that it, it allows you to deal with the complexity of human feelings. Uh, when, you, when you're painting very broadly, you know, it's very easy to look back on the past and think of all the Germans as the Germans at the rallies and all the French as the French who are sort of bravely resisting and, and, and you, you sort of lose sight of the complexity and the nuance. And so I think uh, drilling down and being able to focus on these family stories, these smaller stories of individuals lets you see the heroics, the resistance, and also some of the failures in a way that's real and not just sort of flattened by all the passage of the years. Unfortunately, it uh, looks like we are quickly approaching the seven o'clock hour and our time together here this evening. People uh, that would like to find out more about you and your books, what you have written in the past, what you are planning on writing in the future, uh, what your books we have talked about today, I know you both have websites and other social media engagements. Uh, if you'd be able to share those with us, please. Sure, I'm at www.lanettebinder.com. And uh, that's where I have um, my other writings, events, uh, all those things. And also you can always reach me uh, via the email that's on that, on that website as well. I love to hear from people who've read the book and I'm always happy to send out signed book plates to anyone who would like one for their books. Um, I'm, my website is sandelmorse.com. I tried to type it into the chat, but I don't. Oh, I did, I did succeed. Good for me. Um, and I'm also on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. I also welcome um, emails from folks who have read the book. I love to have a little chat with people um, who have read the book. And... Um, yeah, I just welcome hearing from you, and this has been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really been lovely. I have read uh, both books, and they are both very powerful books, uh, very insightful books. If you have an interest not only in history uh, during World War II, but insights into how humanity is during these times. Uh, They're both, again, very insightful, very powerful books. And please check them out from your favorite bookseller or from your local public library. Elinette Binder, author of The Vanishing Sky, and Sandel Morse, author of The Spiral Shell. I regret that our time together has come to an end. 60 minutes goes by very quickly, but uh, we all thank you very much for being here with us today at the Pikes Peak Library District. Thank you, Brian. Thank you.